Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 9. And again, I mean what I said, I'm going to need your strength today. I, uh, have that, feel like I'm feeling still on a boat. You know, I already walked pretty wobbly anyway, so the boat didn't bother me as much as it does some. I have been journeying over the last month and it took time to plan it and just going to share with you a brief thought this morning. When you are on a, uh, how many of you have been on a cruise before? Lift your hand. Man, y'all are, y'all are terrible. <laughs> That's probably my last one I'll ever go on. I know some of you really like that, but, but to me, I'm on a ship with 3,000 plus people from all different nationalities and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm making friends, I'm connecting with people, I look for ways to, you know, whether it be a hat or a shirt they're wearing, whether it be a Harley or a, or a sports team or something of that nature, I'm just looking to connect. And once I make that connection, then I move in and I get talking to them about the gospel. And those are my joys in life, you know, that I enjoy. So being on that cruise, I saw people that were, my heart broke as I walked through the casinos and uh, saw people that were, uh, whose life just seemed to be in a, uh, reminded me of a, a rat on a wheel going around and around and, and not making any headway or making any purpose. And when you journey, the word journey literally means to change in a position to go or to pass to another place with continuous motion. And this month, I had so much I had to try to press in. In 30, and I'm not against you going on cruises, by the way. You, you go do your thing there. It's good to take a break. But for me, it's, my purpose really does feel. Let me just say this to you. Thank you for going with me. I saw many of you watching me on social media. You went with me. You watched the pictures. You saw where I went. You know, just like my mom. was. Just, she wanted to see where I'm going, what I'm doing, who I'm hanging out with. And so thank you for journeying with me. Thank you for going to my daughter's wedding with me and seeing Richard go lightly and, and, and hanging out in California and preaching for the Hawkins brothers in Oklahoma and, and just hanging out with me. You know, that to me, I just said, I wish I could have brought the whole church, you know. I just wish I could bring people with me to enjoy these, uh, these moments and all the blessings that go on in my life. You know, and now I'm 62 years old, and I'm finally getting to do some of that. But the, the biggest blessing to me was knowing how well the church was doing while I was gone. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, the Scripture says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, let me just stop there real quick. He went through all the towns and villages. Now, of course, towns are bigger. Villages are smaller. Villages are, are the outside of the little towns. But he would go through there, and he would look for people, and he was sharing the good news of the kingdom of God, that this is not all there is. Say that with me. This is not all there is. Come on, say it again. This is not all there is. Hey, Amen, Patsy, I just saw back in my room, I got a little thing up back there with Donald, you know, about his passing and stuff, and, and I realized this is not all there is. Donald's there, and Bernice is there, and, and people we know that have passed on from this life, this is not all there is. There's something, this is good, but good, better, best, never let it be, rest till your good is better and your better is best. We're getting best later. Can I get an amen? Amen. We're moving into that, but Jesus went through the towns and, and, and through the villages there, and he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, healing every disease and sickness, and when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion is love in action. Whenever you have, when you're, you're moved by, by its passion, compassion, it's, it's, it's connected and you see something and it, you, you move by it. It, it affects you. And, and when, when I see, I, I went through down the, uh, the uh, Mendenhall River in Alaska, and as I'm going down the river, I look, and I see a house teetering on the side of a brink there, and it just hit me that just a few weeks ago, I was watching the floods in, uh, in Juneau, Alaska, and that it was taking houses out, and here I'm on the very same river, and I'm seeing the homes that, that have been destroyed by the flood, and, and it just affected me. God, you, you, 
You put me into a place where I saw two weeks ago on TV, and, and here's people's hearts that the floods come through and decimated. I understand this feeling. I have compassion for them. I feel for them. And as I'm reading what Jesus said, he saw the crowds. He had compassion. And we lose our compassion for people. If we go to football games and we don't look around and we or, or baseball games and we see crowds and we don't have compassion on them, if we see ships full of folk just floating around and we don't have compassion on them, what, what good is the gospel done for us how has it changed us how has it affected us and this is what happens in my life i just start having this compassion well up within me they were harassed and they were helpless like sheep without a shepherd we say uh, to the riches you guys have been shepherds to the swap group You've blessed them. Amen. You've helped them. You have guided them. You helped them on their journey. Pastor David, Tony, amen, the things you've done while I've been gone. You've, you've, you know, yesterday a tree fell down in our, our road. And I, next thing I know, David walks into my office while I'm trying to study real quickly, and he's pouring sweat. He's been out there chopping up trees so people can get by on the road. This, and, and Josiah did it, the same, Ramirez. And, and I look around, and I think about our prayer team, and you got shepherds here that are leading and praying, and, and you got Bethany and Jerome that are working with, with the youth and all that with, with our sis group and Pastor Joseph. My goodness, we got a great church. Come on, give God a praise for a great church. I mean, seriously. You, you, can't, you can't walk away from this thing for a month and come back and still got folk here. You know, it's, it's, there's something going on. And I was telling my pastor, I said, I don't feel good today. I, my ear stopped up. And my body is, um, is, is clammy. I'm, I'm struggling on some areas. But I said, the bottom line is, we got a really good church where people, are, they got a fire inside of them. They want more of Jesus. Amen. They, they're not settled on what they've got so far. They want to see more things happen and more people. And then, then the scripture says that they were like sheep without a shepherd. So only thing, what is it that sheep need? You can't just let sheep wander. Sheep need a shepherd. Amen. They need someone looking after them. Now, I know I'm, I'm not, I'm just, I'm an under shepherd. He's the great shepherd, and I'm honored just to get to be a shepherd. But the bottom line in my life is I, I love to see, and, and you know my, my ideology, it goes into my theology. I believe we all start out as sheep, but we become lions. And God wants us to have dominion. He wants us to take control over. That's the gospel truth. That's what God called us to be. But in the beginning, we are like sheep. And you can't get away from that. And like sheep, we need shepherds. We need somebody that's going to step up. Our schools. Listen, young people, it, it, a shepherd is not a certain age. Sir, you can, get, you can lead your 11th grade class, 10th grade class, 9th grade class. You can be a shepherd among all the kids in the school. They just, you know, whenever I was in school, I remember uh, the, the leadership qualities I had. I was considered a leader in my high school, but I had nowhere to lead them to. Amen. I led them into alcohol and drugs. I had nowhere to lead people to. But to have a purpose in life, to be able to lead young people somewhere, we need our teenagers to be shepherds. Amen. We, we need our, our adults where, at work, where you're at. There are people always looking. They're, they want to know why you smile. Why you go through life with joy in your life? Why is it when you've been bankrupt and now you're back on top again? How is it you've been able to handle life and relationships while you do? You got Jesus, man. You know, one of the things I learned on this trip, I love Jesus more now than I did before I got on that boat. I love Jesus, man. I really do. I, I, I'm, in, I'm in love with him more and more because he's carried us through so many places. When I read the scripture, people have been harassed there is a devil harassing them yeah. it hasn't stopped it's been going on for six thousand known years he's constantly harassing people it's the lust flesh lust guys pride of life and he man he's trying to stop us from going forward so the harvest the harvest the harp I, I i i hear this before i've heard it from the even the i've been here in crosby for over 30 years and i've heard it from pastors in this community who have said we've got we don't need another church. They'll say that. We don't need another church here. You know what my attitude is? We need as many churches as the people need. I mean, I, I don't have a problem. I, I'm, for, I'm for churches. 
Hey, I'm for I'm for restaurants, amen. I'm for I'm for things growing. But you know, there there are so many people. Newport is packed with thousands of people. Indian Shores, thousands of people. There are thousands now moving to Dayton, trying to get out of Crosby. You know, they're, they're over in Channel View and, and all over this area. People are all over, but they've been harassed. Harassed is like, is like uh, uh, flies and, and uh, pestilence and things messing with them. They've been harassed. They're helpless. They need shepherds. And I'm here to ask you this morning for us to shepherd up. It ain't just my job. Amen. It's your job. It's our job to shepherd one another, to help one another, and disciple one another. I believe we all start out as believers. You've heard, I've preached this in every church I've been this last month, which is a bunch of churches, that we all start out as believers, and we're being discipled to be like Christ. And on your best day, you like Jesus. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Your best day, you like Jesus. Every now and then, you do something Jesus-like, and you want to reach back there and pat yourself on the back. Don't you? Come on, give me an amen. Amen. So we're believers and we're growing in Christ. We're becoming like him. Yes, we slip, we fail, we fall, but we get back up again. We're getting knocked down. Yeah, I heard that on the ship. Amen. <laughs> As I was stumbling down the hall. Uh, <clears throat> but we do, we get back up. We get back up because it's the grace of God and the love of God in our lives. So we keep on going and we keep pressing on. And this journey, all of us have a journey in life. And when you got born again, God started you on a journey. The book of uh, Philippians says that he that began a good work in you shall continue it until he comes again. In other words, it's not a, a you've matured, you've made it to the, uh, your senior, your graduate. No, 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 no. You don't graduate until I stand over your body. And pronounce it that, that you've gone to be with Jesus. And one day somebody's going to do that with my body. Amen. And I'll graduate. And then whatever God has planned for us on the other side, that, that the kingdom thinking. So when he said this to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. This morning, I'm asking the Lord of the harvest to send forth harvesters into the field. Amen. And for you to understand your workplace is a God place that God put you to reach people. Your schools is a God place where God put you to reach people. Your homes is a God place where God put you to reach people. Amen. And there are people that are harassed and they're helpless and they feel like they don't have anybody, but you can shepherd them. You can help them. You don't have to have a degree to do this. All you got to do is have a heart after God, a passion for him. Amen. I mean, uh, Bethany, I can look at you. I remember 15, 16, 17 years ago. I watched your life grow into what it is today. You know, and if you see her today, you'd think, wow, she's all this. Let me tell you something. Harassed, helpless, in need of a shepherd. And now she is one. You know, and this is our lives as we move through it. So let, let me walk through some things that I, I wrote down for you very quickly. The focus of our passion is the key to beginning the journey. Why is it that people are harassed? Why are they helpless? Because they have no direction. They're sheep without a direction, amen, and we're here to give folk direction. So as you journey in life, one of the things I had to do was I had to decide, okay, what is I'm going to do this month, amen, I, this is going to be a journey. Why do some people succeed where other people fail? Why do some achieve more with less resources than others with greater assets? It certainly is not a matter of intelligence. It's not a matter of education or giftedness or even training. It's passion. The word compassion is used here, but passion, passion is positive. It's something, it's controllable, it's energizing, it's born by the internal flames of desire and vision. It's like a fire in your belly. You know, my desire over the last 30 days was, was to be able to have a renewed passion, reconnect with family and friends, to observe God's creation. Now, there's a difference in passion and obsession. An obsession is negative, it's destructive. Obsessions are born of cravings, fear, or greed. People of passion become winners at life, amen, while those who are obsessed become workaholics and grumpy, amen. Somebody said, you wake up grumpy this morning, oh, I'll let him sleep. 
Passion, passion can be hard to define, but it's important to maintain, and it's impossible to fake for an extended period of time. For 40 years, I've had a passion for Jesus. You, you know, I've seen some people fire up, and they go down quick, but when you got a passion, it stays burning inside of you. Amen. It's something that you want to see happen. Psalm 27, 13 says, I would have lost heart. Oh, I'd have lost hope. Unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. See, I've got a strong conviction that passion like courage is transferable. That if I have passion, you know, I used to golf with H we, years ago. And he has a, has a passion for the game of golf. And that kind of passion drove me on to, be, to want to be better. Never, never exceeded what he was, but it drove me on. And I found this in my life, that my passion for Christ is something that's transferable to others. The more excited I am about God, guess what? Those around me get excited about God. But if I'm dead and, and don't have no desire, no compassion, I don't care about people, I don't care if you're, if you're helpless and, and homeless or whatever, I just let you go, that's not going to work in my life. Amen. That doesn't, that doesn't transfer. I believe we can transfer this. Can I get an amen? I believe it's contagious. Can I tell you what else is contagious? Negativity is contagious. When you're negative, when you're down, when you're upset. That's why I always think about those 12 guys that went over to the promised land. They came back with a report, these giant grapes. And we, it's milk, and it's honey, it's, it's wonderful. But we saw giants over there, and we look like grasshoppers in their sight. Amen. So I look, I look small. I look small in, in my own sight. I, I realized how little I look. And two guys came back, and it was like, I, did I really go with you guys? And I've asked this question before. There were 12 men that went. All of their names are in your Bible. I'll give you two of them, Joshua and Caleb. Give me the other 10 guys. Give me their names. They're in your Bible. But you don't remember their names. Because we don't remember the names of those who decide to fail in life. We don't remember those who don't have no passion in life, no compassion, those that don't want to help. Joshua and Caleb said, hey, give us a mountain, man. We can take this thing. We can win this thing. But the other 10 guys said, well, we, we can't win this thing. And for 40 years, these 10 guys stopped the children of Israel from being able to move forward into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb had to stay in that church. That's what it was like. A church, dead church, every week waiting on all of them guys to die before I can go in and get my promised land. I got to wait. My goodness in heaven. Every time somebody died, it was Joshua and Caleb smiling at the funeral. Thank God another one just bit the dust. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If we get all these guys out of here, maybe we can get into our promised land. Well, it's not that way today. Amen. God's blessed us enough. We don't have to think that way. Can I get an amen? Amen. So, I, and listen to the scripture. Go back to that verse again, Cheryl. I would have lost hope if, unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Man, you want to see good things in this land. Can I get an amen? You want to see your kids blessed and others blessed. So there are things to help us keep direction. I'm going to move very quickly. First, focus. Everybody say focus. Very, set, very, very carefully here, very quickly. What you focus on is what you become full of, whatever you're focused on. So watch what you focus on. You know, when I go hunting, focus is so important. I have to focus because uh, I'm not here to um, look at the landscape. Amen. I'm here to bring something down. Um, you know, one of the joys about being on a little trip like I was was seeing the deer, uh, whales, seals, but mainly things that are edible. Amen. So it takes focus. Second, faith. Everybody say faith. Decide what you're going to, that you're going to trust God. That I won't let uh, Hollywood, the news, well-meaning believers taught me out of what God has for me. Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for, certain of what we do not see. The Message Bible says it like this. The fundamental fact of existence is that this trust in God, this faith, is the firm foundation under everything that makes life worth living. It's our handle on what we can't see. You've got to decide, I'm going to serve God, period. 
No matter what happens, I'm going to keep serving God. No matter how, what happens, if, if I feel bad, ears stopped up, things don't go right, finances take a dip, I'm going to keep serving God. If nobody else serves God, I'm going to serve God. You've got to have faith in God. It's the greatest thing you've got going for you, man. It's your faith. You've heard me preach it a hundred times when Jesus told Peter, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. It's your belief system. It's what you're hanging on to, believing God for. The next thing here, you, you, your future. You got to stay focused on your future. It keeps you moving in the right direction. How much future you got left? I don't know. I'm hoping for tomorrow, a day at a time. But I got a future. You have future. When I see you, uh, Terry Cochran, I, I look at you, I can tell you, I remember a time you had three little boys in, your, in, 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 in church with you. Three little boys. Tommy, Toby, Tony. And now you've got great-grandchildren sitting with you in church. What does that? It's future. It's always seeing yourself in your future, pushing on to your future. When you stay focused on your future, it keeps you moving right. You have to divorce your past to marry your future. Some of your past was not good. You know that. I know that. And you got to let it go. You got to release it and say, no, I'm not going to be there anymore. You know, it's, I, I got to move in the right direction. You know, we're afraid to let go of yesterday's hurts because we won't have an excuse for how we're acting today. We're afraid to let go of yesterday's hurts because it removes the excuse of why we're acting the way we're acting, which brings us to one of the most important points of journaling or taking a journey, and it's forgiveness, learning to forgive. Josiah, amen. Don't get bound to someone or some situation and lose your direction. This can make you lose direction as fast as anything. It does more damage to the vessel storing than the vessel you're pouring out on. I've often said that holding a grudge is like letting someone live rent-free inside your head. Forgive and be free. On just this last 30 days, I had the opportunity to hold grudges, to be upset with, to take offense at something said and said to me. I sought counsel. Listen to me. I'm a pastor of 40, uh, 30 years, preaching 40 years, and I had to seek counsel. And I, I sought counsel from a wise man, and I said, this is my situation. And he said, Pastor, you already know the answer. You've got to let it go. You can't hold a grudge or be upset. And then it was like, uh, what if they were wrong in what they said to you. I said, well, I believe they were. Of course I did. Of course they were wrong. Don't talk to me like that. And he said, can you humbly handle it and just let it go? Don't bring it back up. Release it. And I did. And I can't tell you the joy that came over me when I realized that finally, after 40 years, of serving God, I was mature enough to not let somebody's opinion bother me. It was, I mean, listen, I know I'm supposed to be the, the, the shepherd, the preacher, but man, there are things that bother me too. You want to get on my wrong side? Say something about my church. Say something about the people I love. Amen. And watch what happens. And then it began to happen. You know, when you see an individual who falls time after time and is unmoved by their lack of progress, you can be sure that their fire has gone out inside. Passion is left and apathy has begun. Passion. So how do we, how do we start? I know I got a lot left here, Cheryl, but I don't have a lot left in here. So I'm going to tell you, if you can forgive and release people, Have faith in God. Understand that you too are a shepherd. One of my memories just flooded into my mind was a man who had been a part of a church for years and something happened and uh, he, he, he got offended. He 
walked away from church and for, for months. And this, this happened to me. Let me just be honest with you. I had a dream about someone the other day that, uh, you know, whether they came to church or not, I, I, I didn't wash it. I forgot. Forget it. I don't care anymore. But then they showed up in my dreams. And when they showed up in my dreams, I knew that God was saying, Jerry, you don't get a chance just to let people go like that. You ain't that guy that just cuts people out of your life. You invest in them. And when they walk away, it breaks your heart. So you don't get a chance to just act like they're gone. So I have a dream. Pop in my dream. And I said, oh, God, why you do that to me? And so then I got to call them. And I called them and I apologized for my part. I mean, we all got a part in misunderstandings and hurts. And, and all of a sudden, they apologized back. And I thought, God, you're so good to me in my dreams. Amen. To help me. This is the second dream I've had. Two different people in a month where I've made the phone call. Amen. And God restores the relationship. But I, in my own pride, I wouldn't do it. See, my journey is connected with you and vice versa. And we journeyed by faith and have now for 20 years as a little country church. We journeyed, amen, into a future that we didn't know what, what God was going to do. But look what he's doing in our lives. Look how he's turning things around and changing us. So this man, back to my story, the pastor was told to go see him, so he went, went over to the guy's house. And he walked in, and he sat down with him. And they're staring into the fire. The hearth is burning. The coals are there. And the pastor ain't said a word. He just sat in a rocking chair with the man, and they rocked together. And then the pastor reaches with a set of tongs into the fire, and he pulls out one of the coals, burning red, and he sets it on the side of the hearth, and they just keep rocking. And the man who had been away from God away from church, who had been unforgiving toward others, watched that coal begin to diminish and turn gray and just die out. And he looked over at the preacher, never a word been said, and he said to him, I'll see you Sunday. Because if we separate ourselves, our fires go out. We lose focus. We stop journal, journeying. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Helpless, harassed, without a shepherd. God, I pray for our community people who have been harassed by satanic forces, oppressed, depressed, possessed, addictions destroying their lives, lack of funds, bad choices, no passion in their life, I'm praying that the shepherds will rise, that the sheep will be tended to. They'll find themselves loved, cared for. God, there's so many churches in this one community. Let the shepherds rise up. Let the people in the house rise up. Let us tend to one another. Let us not compete. Help us to understand we're in this together. I want my friends in Crosby and Dayton and Channel View, North Shore, my friends in the Huffman area, God, to know you. I want our teenagers to have fire in the schools with compassion for one another to, to lead. God, take this word. Apply it to our hearts. Thank you, Jesus. If you've been away from God, just put your hand up right now. If you've been away
away from you. Just put your hand up and back down. That's all you got to do. I just want to pray with you. If you've been away from him, thank you. Amen. Who else? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Three, four hands. Wow. Let's pray this together. Jesus, forgive me. Change my life. I've come to you today. I need you. I need more of you. Help me to be a shepherd, to reach people, connect with people. I rebuke Satan for my family, the sphere of my influence. I thank you for the joy that fills my heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God praise in here. Wow, I can't remember ever just getting to tell you that I can't do it. You know, Tom, I just, man, but I have so, so much compassion for this house. Follow, I heard your mom pass, my heart broke. Miss you, mom. I miss so many when I see when I look at her ladies here, her widows in the house. Scripture tells us to look after them. Amen. Let's do the right thing. Amen. Uh, we'll get our offered envelope. Many of you are learning to give online and you're doing it weekly and monthly through that. I thank you for going to holywild.net slash give and doing that. If you have your offering in the envelope in front of you, you're welcome to fill that out. We will have church Tuesday night. If you've not been to a Tuesday night service, it's going to be in the fellowship hall. And uh, it'll be an a opportunity for us to have discussion and talk. And, and hopefully by then, I'll be a little more healed up. You'll be a little more healed up. But I am excited about what God's going to do. I, I see that we have meetings in SWAP this week, or this month, and SIS. And guess what? We are heading toward our 20th anniversary. Isn't that amazing? 20 years as a church. We will celebrate the first week of October. Uh, that's Sunday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday. So looking forward to that. Of course, we'll have food after church. And, We'll fellowship for 20 years. And, and here's the thing. I've been thinking this whole month, how do you celebrate 20 years? I, just, I, don't, I don't know because I feel like if we celebrate too much, it's almost like it's the ending. I don't want to end anything. Amen? I want to keep this going. Believe God for it. So as we give today, we're believing God for more money, less hours. Checks. Gifts. Finance. Settlements, debts, favors, success to the kingdom. Amen. Pastor David, if you'd come. <laughs>